My name is Andreas Fertig. I work as a software developer, as a trainer and speaker, and I also happen to be the creator of C++ Insights. So a little exercise to warm you up. Who here has heard of C++ Insights? Oh, amazing. All right. So the rest of you, I can promise, after this talk, you will at least know what I'm talking when I ask about C++ Insights. Aside from this, the uh, topic of today is fast and small and what are the costs of a language feature. And we are talking about language so far, so I saw the K, it's the slot after Kathleen and Henny. Um, I need to squeeze something in to keep in the mood. Um, and I came up with this. It has phonetic letters on it, so it it's also has um, words from a dictionary, it's brilliant, I think. And it's explanation for my last name. My last name is Fertig. And that's a German word, and it has several meanings like finished, ready, complete, completed, which is excellent. Everybody wants to have me in their project because then they are finished. Actually, it doesn't work that way, but anyhow. I have this name for a really long time now. It's my birth name. Um, and when I came here, I came with two stories I like to share. It happens that I now have three. The first one is, it's hard to type my own name in something like Word or so, because it's an adjective, and it's a small f at the beginning, and not a capital F, which is it for a name. So I always struggle with the spell checker. Who is right when? Because it's not all the time right to use the upper letter. The other one is, it took me, and that's the sad part, the really sad part, it took me roughly 30 years, I'm German, to learn that I mispronounced my own name. <laughs> I say Fertig, usually, with a hard K at the end. And it turns out that in the German language, it's more Fertig sound. So, well, not that good. And when I arrived at a hotel, and they asked me who I am. I said, yeah, I'm Andreas Fertig. And then the person behind the counter said, oh, Finnish. And I said, no, uh, I'm German. And he went, no, no, Finnish. And I said, yeah, now I don't even recognize my own name in other languages. Uh, it's terrible, really. But we are here for C++ today. And pay only for what you use is the motto I associate most and strongly with C++. I really like the language because I think it's brilliant. We have a huge amount of features and we can't just leave them out and we do not pay for them if you don't use them. So for example, it's anyhow not that easy because what it not is is what you see is what you get language. And that's what sometimes people, I think, scares away from C++ because we have constructors and destructors. They are invoked silently, which is brilliant for me because I don't want to invoke my destructor so that I have to write it. I'm happy it was the end of the scope. But it makes it difficult. On the other hand, it gives us the possibility to leave things out, to track things in. And if we are in a constrained project, I, my, most of my work is in the embedded field, so I have constraints, so one thing which almost always drops out are exceptions. And that's fine, I can do that. I can still use C++, maybe not the standard library so far, but all right, I can do it. So, what I like to show you in this talk is some hand-picked selected features and how they work internally. This should give you an insight so you can reason about whether or not to use a feature in a certain project. I'm not advising you to don't use that feature. It's project related. So you can switch all the time and you can use all of them always. So just that you know what you're dealing with. I gave this talk before, also in English, and when I prepared it this time, I realized another, well, odd thing. This picture here, it shows a car. It's more like a van, but 
in the mind it's a car. And in German, car means auto. So it came up that it makes more sense if you know that the word behind which I had in mind is auto, auto. So this car carries all your types because it's an auto. Great. Auto is a nice feature. Came in with C++11 and it eases up our programming life because we don't have to type the same type from the right and the left again. That's the easy part. The other side to it is it also prevents us from some implicit conversions which we only have a hard time to see or find them. It prevents us from making the silly mistakes, these little mistakes we do inadvertently. The crowd here probably is better, but when I gave this talk in the past, some folks afterwards asked me, well, uh, is that a dynamic thing? Is C++ now dynamic? And they said, no, no, this all happens at compile time. So it's like template type deduction. The compiler knew the type all the time. It's just now we have access to it with the auto keyword. And the rules are fairly simple. If you have, for example, a const t ref, then auto deduces just t. If you, on the other hand, happen to have a const t star const, what auto deduces is a const t star. If you think about this, it makes sense because your const t star tells you that you have a pointer to a constant memory and auto cannot remove that. A const reference, on the other hand, well, that just goes away. When I was preparing the talk, this talk for the first time, I tried out a couple of examples and I find myself redoing these examples, adjusting them all the time. And I also do training, so I show this to people, beginners sometimes, and it's hard to get these rules right and see through them, even if the two sentences I told you are fairly simple. So and this is why I came up with C++ Insights, which I know li now like to show you. This is the live part. We have a little trouble with um, the setup here, so the live part is different. And here we go. Excellent. It is inspired by Matt Godball's Compiler Explorer. Who knows Compiler Explorer? Awesome, awesome. Matt is also here and will give a talk, so brilliant. So the idea is to make it easy for you. You can put in your code on the left and you get out the transformation on the right. And the transformation on the right you see is what the compiler internally sees. So in this case for auto, it shows what it did uses. I give you two examples. One is a function called ref, including all the references. So it's a index I have here and it's a const int ref rx to x. And I did use, this with, did use it with auto once the x and once the rx. And below it, I do the same for pointers. All right, easy stuff. And you all know the rules, so I think it's not surprising what comes out here. It's what I told you for the const t ref part, we just end up with our type, with our t. On the other hand, for our const int, uh, const int star const part, we end up just with const int. It's a Clang based tool, so I use the Clang tooling below it. I try to cheat as less as possible, but maybe sometimes I cheat, but this time not. Um, now, these are the easy rules about auto. Everybody knows that, right? So it's not really new. Who knows this? Excellent. So when I give trainings, people sometimes ask me for advice. We need, obviously, to get um, 
a reference, if we did use with auto, we need to write auto ref. But on the other hand, if we have a pointer, we can just write auto and get a point out. So what people start asking me is, well, should I write auto star? And I answer yes, just for consistency reasons. I say also write auto star if you intend to deduce a pointer at this point. There is another reason why it makes sense. And this is this one. I have destruct foo, which does basically nothing, and I have a function called get foo, which returns a pointer to such a foo object. It's more or less a singleton. I think Kathleen Henney also said that he has singleton in his talk, so I have to. It's great. I return this foo, and I have below here all combinations to deduce this foo with audio. And the goal should be, I like, to deduce it to become const foo star, because I do not want to be able to change whatever get foo returns. All right? And this is the part where you need to have it auto star, because if I do the transformation here, only the last line gives me nearly what I wanted. It gives me const foo star. The closer one to what I want is fp4, which gives me const foo star. And this is only possible when I put auto star in this. So that's why I'm arguing for always writing auto star and auto ref here. The next feature we got with C14 actually is decal type and auto. Both features separately came in with C11, but the combination of both came in with C14, and while auto throws away all your top-level qualifiers, the idea of decal type auto is to preserve them. So if you use decal type auto to deduce a type, you get the const and the ref. And I brought you a little example here. I have this variable foo, which I initialize with one, and then I have four other dedicated variables, a to d, which all that use from foo their type. And they do this with a combination of auto and decal type auto. And afterwards, just because I can, I increment foo by one, and then I print the thing. And my question to you is, what's the actual output? Yes. One, 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 two, excellent. See, that's when you see that you're on a real C++ conference, because people know that. The uh, tricky part here is that decal type audio behaves differently when it comes to braces. If you have braces on the right side, it gives you a reference to what it uses. So this is why the last number D is actually pointing to foo itself. That's why we see the increment there. And nobody does this, right? I mean, I like to type less code. So why put braces around a statement like this? Nobody will do it this except if he has a good intention for it, right? Nobody. All right, there, there's this one thing I believe a lot of people like to remove from the language if they could. Um, and is able to produce this, um, this macros. I'm sorry, I have macros in my talk, I didn't mention that. It's such a min or max macro. And if you use this inadvertently without knowing that it's macro, we learned for years that we have to put parentheses around parameters of macro functions to avoid nasty other side effects. It's a brilliant thing to do, except if it comes to decal type auto, like in line number nine. Because 
after the preprocessor is done, what we essentially get is X or epsilon in braces because the braces stay. So a good way to, well, pull yourself a little bit in the food. This is another macro. A random macro incrementing X by one as a post increment. I'm not advising to do it that way, but for now, let's do it that way. It's the same as before. I have this variable foo and four other variables that I did use. The output, I think, you agree, is like before, we put braces around that thing even without knowing it. Now I change this code, this macro, a teeny tiny little bit. We pretend that it doesn't matter for the rest of the logic because it's nonsense anyway. So I change to a pre-increment. What's the result now? And keep in mind that I changed to a pre-increment so other numbers might change as well. It don't comp doesn't compile? Oh, I tried to show you compiling code, so it compiles. One, 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 two, three. Close. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all right. Well, off by one, it's a common mistake. So one, one, two, four. And, oh, you got it. <laughs> so the reason is because I changed from a post to a pre-increment, what a post increment gave me before, it returns a temporary. And there seems to be another specialty about decal type. If you get a temporary, you get the type. In this case, now, with the pre-increment, I get a reference to the type again. And I can show you this again, because I always think it's easier to see than just to hear it. Where's my mouse? So this is the example from the slides. It's the post-increment version, and if I transform this, we see that D, in fact, this time, is just an int, not a reference to an int, even if it's in braces. Special rule for temporaries. If I change this to decode with the pre-increment, then I get, in line number nine, an int ref, because now it's in braces, and the increment happens before. So decal type and decal type audio usually is more for library authors than for standard development, but be careful with that. Having said that, I like to stay for a moment to decal type audio because people tend to try new features and I work with old code, not as young as I, but, well, nearly. And I know statements like this. Who knows statements like this? Oh, all right. So you also work with older code. Who knows what this is and why that in the past had a reason to be there? I did a little digging and I got Two answers. One is people think in their mind return is also a function call, so they li like to write it as a function call, which is all right, but it's not the compelling reason. The compelling reason is this came from C, ancient C, round about the end of the 80s or so. This is from the C reference manual. And in C, this was the only way to return a value. It's return parents value, or return semicolon for returning nothing. So a lot of people still do 
this because they're coming from C, they, I don't know, picked it up. If you do this and use decal type auto, be aware that you might return a variable or a local reference to a variable on the stack. So maybe get rid of this ancient behavior. Something else. We have this code here. It's easy. We, I don't know, can learn it in any language. We can write it a dozen times in the day. We have done it multiple times, I guess, everybody of here. It's really, really easy. Nonetheless, it's wrong for many reasons. Reason number one in this example why it's wrong is I show you the right version here, but the increment of the iterator, I use the pre-increment here, which is the right thing to do. But for some reason, I was taught for years to use the post-increment, to write it plus plus. And it sticks till today. It's really hard for me to write it that way. If you write it with a post-increment, what we get is what we've seen already before in the decal type auto section, we get a temporary a temporary which is created and destroyed immediately afterwards. It's just useless. Thanks to our compilers, it doesn't matter that much, they optimize that stuff away. But if you happen to, well, are in an environment with an older compiler which is not that capable, you may stay with it. Or if you turn off optimizations, same thing. The other not so obvious part is Look at the comparison of begin and end, or it and end. End is a function call. That means that what you are telling your compiler here is call that function end every time you have a new iteration, a new iteration cycle. Is that really what we want? Typically, end is the end marker for something that doesn't change. But we write here, yeah, well, call a function. Compilers are good, compilers are my friend, so it's also most likely to be optimized away. As long as whatever end does is not too complex for the compiler's perspective. If it comes, becomes too complex or has side effects, believe it or not, I know people that like to do some printf here in end just to see that end got called or so. Um, if you do stuff like this, I advise you to not do it, but then the compiler fails to optimize it away. There's no chance. This version is much better. Range-based for loops, I really, really love them. We are now down to write only the essential part for ourselves. We say which variable we like and over which object we like to iterate, that's it. We do not have to write or to decide if we use plus plus it or it plus plus any longer, and there is no end anymore to compare to, at least not for us. It's simplified, it's excellent, it's brilliant. What you can up end with now, I like to point this out, is I've seen that mistake a couple of times when changing code from regular for loops to range-based for loops that we forget the ref here. Most of the time we want auto ref and not just auto, then often what is returned here will lead us to a new object. So keep that ref in mind. What's behind range-based for loops, according to the standard, is this. It's essentially opening a new scope having a for loop in it and declaring your variables for your begin and end. And the brilliant thing here is end is now a new variable produced and introduced by the compiler. So we do not call it each loop iteration. It's not possible. So the bad news for everybody here in the room who needs end to be called in each loop iteration. It doesn't work with range-based for loops, but you should change your code anyway. Now this is 
probably not so nice to read, so I try to give you another example. So here we are. It's not an example I have in the slides, but I have a class X here with a couple of constructors and the member I don't use. And below here I use it to the clear array of two members and then I have this range space full loop here to iterate over it. And if I transform this, then below here I end up with this code. I have this for loop and the compiler has declared all the variables I need inside begin and and it does the comparison, it does the pre-increment, so we are really fine here. It's excellent. What you can also see here is that I can fail. Can fail in many ways. Here, I didn't use auto. All right? In the range based full loop, I didn't use auto. I thought I'm clever, I know the type, I can write it down. Look at the type. The type x is instantiated as int. While I try to be very clever here and make this thing really, really cons. This gives me a constructor call creating a new x object of type const int. Probably not what I want. If I remove this const, then end up with what I really want. No constructor call, just an assignment to the reference, and this is const. So this is what I was trying to say to you at the beginning. Auto can save you of these unfortunate mistakes. Even if you know your type's good, you sometimes squeeze in a const too much or too less. C++ 11 gives me the opportunity to show you such code. It's it's brilliant, it's a waste of nothing. It's a lambda which captures nothing, takes no arguments, has an empty function body, and is invoked directly. So it's a, I think it's a brilliant well, way to show that your optimizer is working, uh, working because it, the compiler can just optimize that thing away. Doesn't make sense here, but it's a complete program, and I'm not sure if it's really the smallest program calling a function in C++, but it's a nice thing. Lambdas are a quite interesting thing. As um, the creator of C++ Insights, I got a couple of issue reports regarding lambdas. I, well, got them wrong in the first place. I'm working on them. So lambdas are the most interesting thing. And Jason Turner had um, recently a C++ Weekly episode showing that you basically need to know or know everything about C++ if you use or know lambdas because each and every element you can use somewhere else like templates, like auto, like type deduction, it's all in there. Really good episode, check it out. So what's behind lambdas? This is the lambda from the slide, and if I transform this, what a compiler does behind the scenes for me is creating a class. And the specialty about this class is that it has a call operator which contains the body of the lambda I have wrote. Per default, it's const. I have to declare the lambda itself mutable to be able to modify members which are in it. The compiler also ensures that the variables which I use in the lambda's body are captured and it then creates the lambda for me, 
below and it evokes the call operator and just returns X. That's nice. So lambdas are classes. That has several implications. Let's change this. Let's say I have here a chassis. I like my A here. Let's change this up here. And to keep it simple, I increment this as well. So now my lambda, lambda grows in size. I have a member C and a member X because I'm using them in the lambda. And if I change it, let's say, in that way, let's make it constant capture by copy. What did I do? Now I need an expression. Ah, thanks. Makes more sense. So now I got the same thing, just without references. Brilliant. Because it's a class, and if we argue for size and speed, this is a simple example. The class of the, uh, the size of the class changes with the order of the captures I do, or how I use them. Because now the capture list is int char, while it was before char int. So if you have a lot of captures, it might matter in which order you capture. Yeah. Oh, without a standard on my hands, I cannot answer this really. Um, no, I'm not sure. But um, I tried it out at least um, with size of expressions and it matched in GCC and Clang, but still I'm not saying it's standardized. It may be just the easiest way to do the captures, to do them in the order they appear. That's, that's my take. And maybe they standardized it too. Yes? The ABI could be too, yeah. 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 Yeah, explicit li uh, capture lists do at least, to my uh, um, knowledge, fix the order. Yeah. So now knowing that there are classes, I have another example. Believe it or not, similar, merely nothing. The variables a to f capture the string foo either by copy or by reference or by named reference. And some of them do try to print them out, some of them don't. None of these lambdas is really invoked, okay? I gave you main, so that's the complete program. I do not invoke them. If I compile this, only the variables b, e, and f generate an unused variable warning. And that's because what's behind it is a class. In b, we say that we like to cop capture per copy everything we use, but we don't use anything. So there is nothing in that lambda. In div, on the other hand, we say explicitly that we like to capture foo by copy. We don't use it afterwards, but we explicitly ask to capture this variable, and the compiler does this for us. And the copy is like a side effect for the compiler. The compiler is not allowed to optimize away this copy we specifically ask for. This is why this lambda stays in our code. This is why it's not optimized away. And I think that's important because if you imagine a bigger program making more sense and you have such a lambda in which you do not use, maybe only for debugging purposes or so, so it copies every time you get past it and it is constructed and destructed because it's a class. So be careful with that. Structured bindings are a nice thing we got with C++11. I'm now able to have such a struct point, declare a variable of that type pt, and I can deduce it together with auto and 
the braces to x, ax, and a epsilon. So I get two new variables out with just one single statement. And what the compiler internally does, roughly, in this case, This is the code from the slides, and if I transform it, I end up with the compiler declaring me two references, ax and a epsilon, to a hidden object the compiler introduced for me. Okay, so I get a copy of the original PT, which then the to variables ax and a epsilon point to per reference. If I change this slightly and say, okay, I like to capture per copy, then this hidden object goes away and the compiler directly points to the initial object. Also worth to know. So you get a copy in some cases here and in others you don't. But it's what you ask for, it's just fair. Structured bindings are a nice thing. And the lookup order for the compiler, which it uses to figure out if something is decomposable, is the following. The compiler first checks if the type in question is an array. An array is a relatively easy type for a compiler. It knows everything about it, the size. It only has accessible um, elements, so everything is fine. If it's not an array, the compiler next checks for a symbol called std tuple size. Yes, really, std tuple size. Brilliant idea from the standardization committee. It checks if your class has a member std tuple size or if a symbol std tuple size for your class is in the global namespace. So this is one time when you can inject something in the std namespace. The third, one is the compiler checks if this is a class with only public members or struct, for instance. So when first coming across this, I thought, okay, basically I aim for the last thing, I have a class, but with private members because it's a class and I like to encapsulate and not to give world access to it. So how do I get this thing working? This is a slightly modified version of the the point class, it's now a class with two private members, mx and m epsilon. They are doubles now and not ints anymore, so just to give you little differences here. And it has a function get and set for both x and epsilon. And to make this struct or this class decomposable, all we need to do is to make the compiler happy. That's always a good thing, no warnings, no errors and so. We can make the compiler happy if we provide it with this symbol std tuple size for our class. This is what I have here in line one. I have to say it's for my class point and it's the size of two. The size refers to the number of elements I like to decompose. I can lie at this point, it's up to me but I try to be honest and I say, okay, I have two members in that class, so the answer, the right answer is two. Next, I have to provide a symbol called tuple element, also in the namespace std, and this gives the compiler the answer to which type is at this index. So I have two versions of this std tuple element here for index zero and index one, those saying, okay, your type is double. Now the compiler is able to decompose or to know that the decomposition is possible here. What's missing is the actual access function, which is get, which I provide you here. And here I use another feature of C++ 17, it's the const expert if, which of course is written if const expert, just, well, as an exercise. In this function, 
it's a nice thing about context prayer if I can have one function which is get, it's a function template, and the parameter in coming in is equal to the index I like to access, or the compiler likes to access to do the decomposition. So I have there one and two, and I can return either a variable or a function like I'm showing you here. And I don't know if you're surprised by this or not, of course I can do things you might not expect. Usually I expect that what I get back equals to the order of the variables I declared in the class, so first x, then epsilon, but I change the indices here, so I return x at position one and epsilon at position zero. It's up to me. I can change this. Enough about structured bindings. A question. What do we know about static keyword? There are several application areas and I like to focus on just one. And this is if we use static for declaring a variable within a block scope, function scope, or something like this. We all know probably that the first time control passes this variable declaration, it gets initialized. That's well, like a feature, so give you a bit of code. Again, like a singleton. So the first time I pass line three, the singleton object gets created. That's brilliant. That's a part of this feature. And the standard makes it easy, at least for us developers, programmers. It says here is performed the first time control passes through its declaration. Ah, that's it. Easy. I took that granted for years by border. And I already said I teach students and sometimes they're really brilliant. One of them one time asked me, how does this work? I said, well, I can point you to the standard which says that it's working. I said, no, 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 how does it work? I said, well, I need to get back to you. I don't know. I actually don't know. I was all the time happy that it's just working, which is also good, right? So, how does it work? It works roughly like this way. This is conceptual code. Um, it's based on what I found out from GCC. So the compiler introduces a new variable of type bool. I call it compiler computed here. And also it changes our declaration statement a little bit. So our declaration of the singleton itself is now only a, a char buffer of size big enough to fit the singleton into. And then we have this if here, which checks if the variable compiler computed is true or not. If it's not set to true, we go down and I believe the compiler does it better, but to show you here, it's a placement new, the compiler invokes the constructor of the singleton object, and that in the memory you allocated before in line four with the static buffer. After that, it sets the variable compiler computed to true, and everything is fine. The order here is important. I'm not sure if it was GCC or some other compiler who had a bug, because the order was changed and the standard requires that if the construction of this object fails, you can redo it as often as you want. So if the constructor of singleton throws an exception, you should be able to redo it. So you supposed to only set a variable to true after you successfully initialize the class. That's important here. Also important is we of course only come to this new statement exactly one time. And in the end, we return this singleton. So that's what the compiler does. Brilliant, right? So easy, so simple, that it's absolutely not thread safe. Okay, everybody agrees. So hard time to get this thing thread safe. 
I don't know, alcohol, pill, pain pills, whatsoever. Yeah, Victor? Ah, good question. No, it's not, because um, the, the bool itself is a trivial type. Trivial types are initialized before or at, at program startup, so before we pass this. This is also the trick why I have a char buffer here and not the original um, class itself. So that bool will uh, initialize way before we reach this. So, no, that's, that's fine, in fact. The standard changed one line in C++ 11, or added one sentence, if control enters the declaration concurrently, while the variable is being initialized, the concurrent execution shall wait for completion of the initialization. And we are good to go. That thing is thread safe. Yeah, cool, right? Thread safe, really? We had a hard time for years. And now this compiler manufacturers believe they know. Yes, they do. They are really good. But how do they do? Roughly this way. The uh, bool is propagated to something like an int. It's more in mutex, so we need a little bit more storage space. And we can roughly use it as a bool, so we still check if it's set to true or something not zero. And then two new functions kick in, CXR guard, required or acquire, which takes this compiler commuted variable, this mutex, and behind this function, the compiler has all its knowledge, what is the threading system you're using, pthreads, mutex, whatever, and it uses this compiler commuted variable to lock, at this point, every other thread out. So only one thread gets this compiler commuted mutex, so only one thread gets into this if, does the new placement new, and sets the compiler commuted variable to true, and after that says CXR guard release to release that mutex. All other threads are, which are in the queue, probably maybe in CXR guard acquire, now fall out and do not get into the new part, so they get um, the true. Uh, false, sorry, false back. So it's only initialized one time. Yeah? Remember you mentioned, you talk, you mentioned in the second class about the actual double check lock to do this at the queue. If the false guard can be a copy, right? Could be. I tried to figure that out with um, Compile Explorer, but I'm not really, also, I, I use GCC and um, Compile Explorer, but it changed. So what are you basically saying is that um, I messed up the double check locking pattern here, so I need to do another check if compiler computed after having the, uh, the mutex acquired. Um, I, I believe it's right, but I cannot prove it either with, with my GCC knowledge, nor does the compiler explorer help me at this point, but it varies from architecture to architecture. Yes? Um, yeah, okay, the suggestion was there maybe um, the alignment is not um, right here, so yeah, it's, it's conceptual, just to give you an idea. It, I'm not um, advising you to write code <laughs> like this, so that's not the idea. All right, so, for me it's been a pleasure giving this talk to you today. Hope you enjoyed it, um, and I'd like to come back to the beginning, because it's so nice. At this point, I am fertig. <laughs>